Welcome back to another episode of the Future Cities Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Elser. A couple months ago, we released an episode where we tried to define resilience from social, ecological, and technological perspectives. Included in that episode was a conversation between Sam Markoff, a postdoc in the Eurex Network, and our guest, Dr. Dan Eisenberg, who is now an assistant research professor at the Naval Postgraduate School. Dan shared with us his knowledge about resilience from an engineering background, and in that episode, we unfortunately had to cut out a lot of interesting stuff for the sake of time. But since there was so much great content, we thought that it would be worthwhile to share the full interview with you now. So without further ado, we'll jump over to the start of that conversation. All right. Uh, Hi, everyone. This is Sam Markoff, and today we are going to be talking to Daniel Eisenberg, who is a soon-to-be PhD graduate uh, here at Arizona State University in sustainable engineering, and his work primarily focuses on uh, resilience as well as some network science elements. So, uh, Dan, welcome in. Thanks for uh, for talking with us today. Thanks for having me, Sam. Yeah. It's always a pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess we'll just jump in with sort of a broad question. Um, so what does resilience mean to you or from a, an engineering perspective? Resilience from an engineering perspective. So just so you know, um, my background is also kind of in a military context, right? So I first started working on critical infrastructure resilience at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in the engineer, U.S. Army Engineer Research and Development Center, ERDIC, um, and the Risk and Decision Sciences team. And I did that before starting my PhD here at Arizona State University. And back in 2013, when I started doing that work, essentially uh, Presidential Policy Directive 21, Obama put out, as well as Executive Order 13636, These were these two guiding documents for all federal agencies essentially saying we need more resilience and it was focused largely on cyber infrastructure and risk management but it was it was also talking about all infrastructure systems of the united states which includes energy water communications mobility anything that you can really think of that's providing important lifeline services uh, was under the sun of uh, under the umbrella of we need resilience and About the same time and within those guiding documents, definitions of resilience came out that have largely been the ones that the engineering community has drawn upon, that I'm aware of. And uh, the National Academies of Sciences definition from their disaster resilience, a national imperative report that came out in 2012, is kind of a indicative one that follows both the definitions that was in the executive order, presidential policy directive, and is also cited, and that's the one that's... uh, Resilience is the ability to plan and prepare for, absorb, recover from, and adapt to adverse events. <laughs> so it's like four things, planning and preparing before something happens, absorbing damages while it happens, recovering after you're able to arrest or absorb the problem, and then hopefully adapting and changing the system in the future to better deal with those situations that caused that problem in the first place, right? So that. Uh, Those four processes add up to what comes up to be what people refer to as a critical functionality curve. So if you have your power grid or your water distribution system or your roads and they're providing a specific service like electricity or clean water or mobility, that critical service that's being provided, you plan and prepare for maintaining, recovering, and adapting it when the problem occurs you absorb those damages, you lose some services, maybe you cause, you know, you have to cut some people off of the power grid to arrest the problem, cause a small blackout, or people lose water, or people lose access to transportation. But then you recover the system back to its previous service level and hopefully change it to try and deal with the problem again. And that's, in a nutshell, what most people uh, look at when they talk about engineering resilience. Now, you and I know that I don't agree with that <laughs> yeah. definition, and I don't agree with that perspective in terms of how we should approach it, uh, resilience for critical infrastructure systems. And uh, the way that I think about resilience is characteristically different. Uh, is It's hard to describe, I think, in words, but uh, there's a pretty important work that came out in 2015 by Dr. David Woods, who's from Ohio State University, that's looking at four concepts of resilience. One is rebound, 
which is bringing your system back up to its original capacity, which if you think of the National Academy of Sciences definition and the definitions that are in public policy all over the place for infrastructure, that's rebound is kind of exactly what they're looking for, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at least in the recovery. Um, another one is robustness, which is the ability to uh, design systems that not, like automatically handle threats up to specific design thresholds. And that's largely captured in this kind of absorption process in, this, in the National Academy's de definition. A third perspective, which is not really captured in the other engineering perspectives, is called extensibility, or sometimes referred to as graceful extensibility, but I don't really use the word graceful because it largely just means it worked. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's extensibility, which is uh, being able to um, extend current practices and processes to meet shifting and uh, adaptive surprises as they occur. So instead of relying on built-in thresholds like the height of a levee or the height of a dam or the, um, I don't know, power line rating on how much current can go through a specific transmission line or distribution line, it's how can you change your current practices and break the rules and use these in different use these infrastructures in different ways that would be beyond their natural designed uh, it, the natural designed uh, purpose. Uh, to help arrest damages before they occur. And if you're really good at extensibility, you might not need to you know, absorb, uh, recover, or adapt afterwards. You just naturally kind of don't experience the problem at all. Um, and then the last one is called sustained adaptability, which is, uh, I, you know, is really just a rebranding of the word evolution yeah. um, <laughs> and is trying to encapsulate a lot of the ecological or socio-ecological perspectives of resilience that I'm aware of, where you have systems that are undergoing change that are constantly failing and recovering over time. And by going through these multiple cycles of booms and busts, you're able to evolve to a better state that deals with them better into the future. And so it wouldn't be just like one pass through planning and preparation, absorbing recovery and adaptation. It would be like multiple passes and seeing how systems would change over a longer scale. Um, and to me, resilience is not to say we want to better absorb, better recover, better adapt, or better plan and prepare. It's to say sometimes we need to be really robust to a problem. We need to build a higher levy. But sometimes building a higher levy is just going to put you in a worse position in the future. And so that might not be the best option. So instead of doing this robust solution, you might then say, OK, we're going to try and change a practice or put something in place that allows us to um, improvise better, which would be more of an extensibility uh, solution. Uh, equally, maybe we're going to double down on a specific rule that seemed to work, and we're going to say, OK, we don't ever want to have this problem again, so we're going to say everything has to meet this new standard, and by setting that standard, you're now creating a situation that leads to more sustained adaptability because you have to evolve around something that doesn't change. And uh, rebound is just one way in which systems can respond. You know, you could transform systems as well. So maybe bringing the same pipeline or power line or roadway back up isn't necessarily the solution in the immediate aftermath of a disaster. Maybe we should just be building an entirely new system and use the same amount of money, same methods to do something else. So resilience is about applying the right strategy to your current context. And it, to me, it's really about this kind of active verb um, process of adapting to the surprises as they occur. And you have a suite of different solutions that are available to you, not just saying, we're going to put more money into planning and preparing, more money into recovery, more money into strengthening or absorbing damages, and more money into adapting systems uh, to you know, deal with those problems afterwards, which is largely what's encapsulated in the engineering perspective. Yeah, so I guess to, uh, at, the, at the risk of, of uh, throwing in a cliche, it's, what, what I'm hearing is that Resilience is more about the journey than the destination, or at least how, how, <laughs> how you're starting to think about it and how a lot of us here at, at ASU are starting to think of it rather than uh, trying to trying to accomplish a certain amount of a, a certain objectives. And then once those are accomplished, OK, we're done. We're our system is, quote unquote, resilient. It's it's an ongoing 
continual process that yeah. It, yeah. evolves uh, all of these different stages and moving across these different stages as needed. So the the engineering perspective that you'll find in you know the vast majority of either uh, actual frameworks and, and business processes that are out there in infrastructure systems right now or in academic literature, these like disaster resilience, uh, National Academy's perspective, it, it has a built-in expectation as to what is a positive outcome, and that's the problem, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's the journey to ensure whatever positive outcomes are, and sometimes positive outcomes aren't because you recovered the system, it's because you transformed it. Yeah. Or sometimes positive outcomes aren't because you followed your standard of practice, it's because you broke the rules at that time, right? Uh, you know, case in point, an example we like to talk about a lot is uh, when Sully was flying the, and landing in the, the Miracle on the Hudson, he had a standard of practice that he could have followed for ditching a plane in a, in a water landing situation. But that standard of practice was written for being at like full cruising altitude and having not necessarily both engines and all auxiliary power shut off, which was the situation they had. They were just after takeoff and everything failed. And in that situation, because they ditched the standard of practice and jumped from like page one to page four technically on the list, they were much more capable of making that descent and making that correct solution that eventually saved the day and led to no deaths, right? Um, The idea in the work that we're doing is trying to figure out, okay, what are the conditions that make it more likely that people will be able to navigate this really complicated situation when handed a big problem like all your engines fail? Okay, let's follow the rules or let's break the rules. And being able to understand, okay, these rules, these these standards of practice are not going to serve me right now, and so I need to improvise. Or these standards of practice are exactly what I need to do right now, and by following them, I'm going to, you know, prevent the nuclear meltdown and prevent the plane from crashing. Yeah. And that's the big question for, I think, engineering resilience right now is to say we can build these systems and we can make them, you know, survive really complicated and damaging hurricanes or floods or heat events or terrorist attacks, but you can't prepare for everything, and when the surprise does come, if you can't deal with that, you're not really resilient. You know, Resilience is about being able to do the stuff that you can't imagine, you can't imagine. And at the end of the day, you want it to be like, okay, it was a success yeah. versus what we would call a failure, which is also you know, poorly defined. It's just we know we experience, when we experience it, but you know, failure is not something that you can like, write down, this is failure you know, right. Right. before it really happens. Yeah, and you know, as we all know, we're living in a very complex world, and so just because you can't imagine uh, something going wrong doesn't mean that it won't go wrong. And so that's where having sort of both robustness and extensibility can be really powerful because it helps you, on one hand, you, there are certain things that we know or we can expect. Uh, so that's where robustness can come into play. Uh, but on the other hand, there's going to be surprises that, that we're likely to be subject to, and we don't know what form those are going to be, how severe they are. And so that's where this concept of extensibility can be really powerful. Um, and like you just mentioned, I think, yeah, I think it's a great example with, um, with Sully where, you know, the, the robustness approach was sort of, you know, going step by step through the, uh, emergency manual. Uh, but you know, that was only made or designed for certain situations and that did not apply to this particular situation. So he kind of, um, you know, inherently switched over to this more extensibility model and, and was able to sort of break the rules, uh, but still have sort of this this outcome of saving, you know, hundreds of lives. So, um, so yeah, that's a really nice example of, of how yeah. those two uh, can play off each other. The question is, and the big issue that's happening in infrastructure is that we're not revisiting the models that the, or the perspectives that were used in the initial designs when the real problems start occurring. Um, an example of this is in the recent Oroville incident where the primary spillway for the largest dam in the United States failed and broke down. And there was a giant hole in it that led to erosion and concrete getting everywhere, causing the power plant nearby to be backed up and had to shut that down with incoming water from essentially rain in Northern California that was melting snow 
and there was just a bunch of incoming water. They had nowhere, no, nothing to deal with it except for their emergency spillway, which had never been used. And the emergency spillway in Oroville was essentially just the mountainside, <laughs> right? Up until that point, if you made your assumptions like some people on site, some of the people who were involved in the crisis did on the same assumptions that were made back in the 1960s when the dam was first constructed, you would think that this emergency spillway would be a totally fine solution, right? right? It's geologically sound. It was designed for this purpose. It should be able to handle uh, additional water and prevent potential dam collapse. But anyone who knows the details of the event knows that the second that the emergency spillway was activated, um, erosion started to happen so quickly that the geologists on site were essentially saying, we are on like immediate dam collapse. This could happen within the next hour, potentially. And they had the largest evacuation in Northern California because of it. And one of the actions taken, which turned the primary spillway that was broken back on to a, a higher discharge rate, was one of the ways that they essentially prevented this dam collapse from occurring. And there's no rules for that right. situation, right? That you're now put into this context where neither spillway is going to work, which one you're going to choose because either one's going to cause problems and we want the dam to stay up. Otherwise, I think, uh, you know, this might be a bad quote, but the numbers that I've heard from some people where there could be like 30 feet of water in Sacramento within 30 oh, hours. Wow. Yeah. Right? So it's like the capital of California could have been just inundated yeah. if this dam went down. So in those situations, we're trying to better understand this relationship between the people on site who have to improvise like Sully did in the airplane and the people who are designing the infrastructure, right? If we can be more clear about the assumptions that go into the design and the ways in which failures and risks happen and the way in which people are experiencing it when it actually occurs, we might be able to very quickly revisit these assumptions and make better decisions. You know, if, we, if we're able to update our models in our heads of, okay, we know that this is a... Uh, I don't know, an engine failure situation that has never been assumed before, then improvis improvisation might be the only option that we have available. Or we know that this is a, a water, uh, you know, the, <laughs> the actual weather system is called a Pineapple Express. It's a Pineapple <laughs> Express situation with so much water behind the dam that we've never experienced this before. Uh, we need to be aware that we're in a, what I call a fundamentally surprising state, and then start kicking in this, okay, so what kind of assumptions do we have that we need to revisit? What are the new ways that we can deal with this problem? How can we change the way we think about our infrastructure in the moment that then changes the calculus about what you have available to you in terms of solutions, right? Yeah. Then it's the only solution isn't just wait for the levee to fall over. Yeah. Right? It isn't just wait for the dam to fall over. It's like you can use infrastructure in new ways. You can try new things. And those sometimes are the things that save the day. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's, so that's what I've been pushing for lately is moving towards this language of surprise. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of things we've been talking about that are really important. One is thinking of resilience as this process or this verb and these actions that people are taking, um, and choosing between which strategies you have available. One is choosing the strategy and choosing the approach that leads to positive outcomes, whatever those might be. And those outcomes are dictated by, you know, whatever positive outcomes you might be wanting, less deaths, less damages, you know, more access to more equitable solutions. And then this other thing is about whether you're dealing with what I call a situational surprise, which is something that is possible within the realm of the existing design that's yeah. available to your dam or to your power grid. And it's just a rare occasion. Yeah. So there's some historical precedent either within that within location that. or system or at least in a comparable system somewhere. So it's in the initial somewhere. design yeah. in the design or in the way in which it's operated. It's like it's like it's within the scope of mm -hmm. imagination yeah. to a certain extent. And then fundamental surprise, which is outside of it. So the example that I've been using lately is situational surprise is when you buy a lottery ticket and you win the lottery. Mm -hmm. Right. Because it's really rare that you win the lottery and you're like, oh my God, I actually won the lottery. But it's within your scope of your imagination because you have this lottery ticket that you purchase that you win. Yeah. And then it's fundamental surprise is like you don't buy a lottery ticket and you win the lottery. Yeah. <laughs> it's like something you've done has led you to be, you know, 
capable of winning the lottery you didn't even know. Yeah. And now you just have all this money and you, you have to revisit all the assumptions you had about the lottery before to understand how that you even got the money in the first place. Mm-hmm. When you're in the first situation, that might be the situation where uh, following the standard of practice that's available might lead you down the path of positive outcomes. Mm-hmm. If you're in the second situation, that might be where you're either Captain Sully and have to just act on instinct and skill, or you might be Orville Dam, where you have geologists on site that you can revisit assumptions really quickly and try new solutions that aren't necessarily available in the original thoughts about the dam. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So can you talk a little bit about uh, the elephant at the traffic light? Because I oh, think that yeah. also helps illustrate this concept a little bit, okay. and sort of the, the, the surprise element. Well, it took me a long time to really understand the concept and differences between like robust design versus extensible design and the way that I think about it for infrastructure and engineering systems. The example that I like to use when I try and teach it to people is uh, you have two different ways of dealing with traffic at an intersection. One can be a uh, induction loop current based sensor that when a car or a large metal object shows up at the intersection, it creates a magnetic field that then creates a current that a sensor picks up and says, ooh, there's a car waiting here or there's more cars on this side of the intersection. We're going to change the lights and rearrange the ways in which we're going to let traffic through to let more traffic through and have more mobility. You know, It's a really efficient, really effective way of dealing with it. The, the problem with that is uh, if an elephant were to show up at this intersection, let's say here in Phoenix, yeah. we're sitting in Phoenix, I doubt any of their sensor equipment, whether it's induction loop or other, <laughs> has been designed to recognize elephants. Right, unless there's a scale there, which there is. Yeah, maybe yeah. not. You know? <laughs> the elephant's not going to cause the same uh, magnetic loop and, uh, and current. But, you know, sometimes people ride elephants through the street. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and when that happens, it could cause a bigger problem. And there could be, you know, a, what I would call, you know, a big fragility or robust failure um, when traffic gets worse because this elephant just causes a big issue that can't be dealt with with the sensor system that you put in place. Uh, on the other hand, you could have a traffic cop at that, at that intersection. And the traffic cop would be able to deal with both cars and motorcycles and buses and the elephant, you Mm -hmm. know? It would look at the elephant and characteristically understand, okay, we got an elephant, I'm gonna treat this in a certain way and it'll help it get through the intersection. The problem is, in a lot of cases, you know, traffic cops might be less efficient than the robust or or technological solution that you have. Um, Traffic cops are expensive and require tons of training and they, you can't, put one at every intersection in the city uh, without a tons of like unlimited resources, right. essentially. Right. And p- police officers serve multiple s- purposes where if they decide, okay, I'm going to deal with this intersection now because there's an elephant there, that naturally makes the rest of the city potentially at like a slightly more risky situation because there's one less police op- right. officer available to be supporting actual, you know, crimes or emergencies that yeah. they could also be Is that the best use of our police force? Is that the yeah. best use of the police yeah. force, right? So um, the when, when the induction loop sensor gets totally overloaded by and fundamentally surprised by the elephant, it it's it's because there's a built-in fragility in the system that there's just thresholds and design space that were never considered. Uh, when the city has a, I don't know, uh, deals with the elephant because a traffic cop is there, but has a bigger problem somewhere else, else in the city because a traffic cop decided to deal with this specific issue, it's what I refer to as decompensation. Mm-hmm. And it's because uh, either... Uh, people are working across purposes, like people are, are being extensible and breaking rules or making their own individualistic decisions that put the entire city at a greater risk than that risk is realized at that specific moment. Um, or, uh, yes, actually, uh, I forget right now. It's working across purposes yeah. <laughs> is, is a big one. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not even just elephants. I, I'm sure, uh, you know, I'm not the only one that's been riding my bike and been stuck at a red light yeah, for yeah, yeah. like 10 minutes trying to trying to get the sensor to recognize me as waiting for the red light. So Yeah, if you uh, had more steel, yeah, a yeah. much heavier bike with a lot more, exactly. you know, mag- ferromagnetic materials, <laughs> iron or whatever, yeah. um, then you wouldn't have to worry about it, but right. because it's not designed for you and your bike, you run into the same kind of situation. Yeah. 
Hey everyone, Steven here. We're just going to take a quick break from the interview to introduce a new segment we're calling City Snippets. These snippets will just be short clips giving you a glimpse into events and research happening in cities across the world. Mostly, these clips will highlight the cities in the Eurex network, but if you know something cool happening in your city that generally fits into the themes that we talk about in this podcast, please let us know and your snippet could be shared here. This time, I want to tell you about the Heat Mappers Walk that just happened here in Phoenix. This event was a community effort to establish a baseline for thermal comfort along common walking routes and bus stops in downtown Phoenix. The event had around 100 participants who walked around and recorded their experiences and comfort levels. This sort of information is really important for a city like Phoenix where extreme heat is frequent and prolonged. And these data will hopefully be used to track and improve our collective experience of heat over time. The event was a joint effort organized by the Nature Conservancy of Arizona in partnership with the Museum of Walking, Phoenix Revitalization Corporation, and Arizona State University. Now we'll rejoin our interview with Dr. Dan Eisenberg, where he tells us how his thoughts on resilience have evolved. While working at the Army Corps, I became really sensitive to the notion that um, all the work I was looking at for infrastructure resilience was seemed to be and seemed to be ignoring the people Mm -hmm. involved in infrastructure yeah like it would be a side note you know this had like we need to design infrastructure with these 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 different qualities and then also good operations or something like that and i was like why is this like you know one bullet out of ten when they're like half of the thing that's in the system they're the ones actually dealing with the problem yeah and by the time i ended the army corps i was like the thing i want to focus on is how we start talking about this you know, human and technological interaction that's going on within infrastructure systems on a really big scale, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think that's a, sorry to, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. I think that's a that's a, a big element that's often sort of missing in, in our training as un, as engineers. And then even, you know, once once we get out into the, the you know, the, the job market and are working, it's uh, sort of this, heavy emphasis on sort of just the technological components of these infrastructure systems and, and uh, not fully sort of recognizing or acknowledging the social and the uh, ecological and the environmental components as well. And, and even just your example of, you know, the solar panels and presenting at the conference, yeah. that's, a, that's a clear example of that, you know, you're, I had no on idea the, on the, maybe the technical and the environmental, but then there's, you know, the economic and social components of that too. So yeah. So uh, just, yeah, that, that's a really important part uh, point that I think us as engineers should continually kind of strive to get better at is, you know, figuring out where these technological systems, how they fit within the context of these broader social and, and ecological environments. So, yeah. um, sorry, sorry. Yeah. No, but that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's really what got me started. You know, mm-hmm. I was like, when I first came to ASU, I came to Arizona State University to work with Dr. Thomas Seeger because he was both a colleague of Igor's. He was helping me co-author my first paper on resilience while working with Igor. Um, and I just knew that he had it both. He was a good writer, which I really appreciated. Yeah. And he had kind of this broader perspective less on, okay, you can figure out the equations that you need at the end of the day, but why do they matter? Mm-hmm. Right. And this why question was really important to me because it, the way that I've kind of summed it up, at least in my work is when you go to a power grid operations control room, or you go to a generation plant, or you go to a water distribution system and their control room or their, I don't know, operations, you know, equipment and all that stuff. None of those rooms are empty. There's people standing in those rooms, Yeah. right? It's not just computers doing it and just it can, the, the, everything it has no hand, is hands off, right? Right. People are involved in these processes. Mm-hmm. And it just seemed so strange and still seems strange to me that a lot of the things that, the ways in which we're teaching engineering to people and the ways in which we think about resilience often uh, cuts out the reality of the situation, which is as the problem occurs, something is going to happen and a person's going to act. Yeah. Right? If Sully didn't act, <laughs> yeah. that would have been a very different situation. Mm-hmm. And so there, there's also, you know, s- similar uh, uh, examples of people taking action that lead to the problems getting worse. Yeah. And a lot of people focus on this human failure component, but I like to focus on like the humans providing like successes because at the end of the day, I think one of the big issues we're going to have to deal with with infrastructure going forward is 
how much automation versus how much, you know, decision making and human interference are we going to allow in our mm-hmm. systems? We're getting to the point where we can have everything fully automated right. uh, on scales that people won't even be able to interact with, right? Uh, there are time scales that infrastructure works at that humans just can't actually press a button or the, the brain blood barrier or whatever doesn't, <laughs> doesn't work at this speed right. <laughs> as, as the electricity in the power grid does yeah. sometimes. You know? yeah. uh, so we need certain systems to be technologically, technologically controlled, but everything else, you know, there's going to be this human technological interaction. And um, although my perspective has evolved over time, the more that I encounter um, assumptions that are made that either completely ignore the people or completely ignore the technology in the equation. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not so much in this ecological perspective, which I'm really interested in understanding more of, but from the socio-technical perspective, it seems like it's either dominated by someone who thinks that, you know, the humans are the solution, mm-hmm. and they're, or it's dominated by people who think that technologies are the solution, when at the end of the day, you know, based off of my elephant example, humans are the solution sometimes, the technologies are the solutions other times, yeah. and they both serve different purposes, and they actually deal with very different situations and produce very different consequences, you know, positive or negative, whatever. So we can't just be reliant on one. Right. We can't be like, we can't, the problem with the National Academies saying this, you know, recovering is always good, pushes you in a situation where you won't transform when you really need to. Mm-hmm. And that's a big problem that right. I see. That's coming from a perspective that says we got it all figured out. There's only one way to think about infrastructure when the meaning of it changes all the time, the way in which it operates changes all the time. The plans, practices, uh, regulations change all the time. Yeah. You know, in the power grid, economic models completely changed when we went from, you know, decentralizing the whole system and, and moving to, a, instead of vertically integrated to horizontally integrated in, in that, we, we have to, th- you have to be able to deal with those problems. Yeah. Otherwise, what is resilience anyway? Right. You know, what's the point? Right. Exactly. Yeah. So just to kind of be, begin to wrap up. So do you, are, do you have any, uh, good examples of, of organizations or, or entities that have done a decent job of sort of striking this balance between the technical and the human side of things, or if not an, a clear example, how do you think we can get there? How do you, how do you view your work sort of moving forward, helping us move closer to, to, to striking that balance? I feel like there's a, uh, so a lot of my perspective is drawing from safety science literature, not engineering per se, and not uh, social science on its own. It's some kind of weird mix, and it's usually under the umbrella of safety. And so there's a lot of people, I think, in the safety science world who get it. Um, And these people are both in academia and within the utilities and organizations that manage our infrastructure. I was just at a conference put on by the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, which is kind of like the high-level um, company that sets rules and regulations that are then adopted by individual countries within North America, Canada, U.S., Mexico for the U.S. power grid, for mm-hmm. the whole U- North American power system. And this room is full of people from utilities and from different kind of academic circles that kind of get what we're talking about. The problem is it's really di- they still we still don't have the tools for implementing them, and that's that's where I think things need to go. Um, one industry that gets it right uh, is the airline industry when it comes to the treatment of of accidents with planes. Mm-hmm. So this recent Southwest uh, uh, explosion um, that happened with a, a, a what is it an uncontained failure of the engine that yeah. led to a window breaking mm-hmm. and a death. Um, the, the reason why, one of the reasons why I believe that that plane landed safely was because they had institutional capacity in what they call just culture, which comes from the safety science literature. Usually it's largely discussed by kind of luminary people like Sidney Decker, um, and, uh, Eric Hallnagel and, and Dave Woods, but mostly Sidney Decker writes lots of books. So you can go read about this where, one of the reasons why we end up in a situation where we end up with these robust failures and people follow the rules when they, when, when they really need to improvise is because 
when people make mistakes that aren't nearly as bad as uh, you know, taking down the whole power grid or leading to death, we fire them, you know, mm. we, we treat them in a way that makes it so if you don't follow the rules, if you don't do exactly what we're supposed to be expecting to do, you're going to get kicked out of the organization, you're going to become a, an example of things we don't like, we're going to create a culture within our organization that doesn't actually learn from the internal problems that we have. And aviation industry has taken this upon itself to be more effective at trying to un not, you know, bring the hammer down right. on people who make mistakes, you know, whether it's the, the pilot or the technician or the guy on the ground who's waving, you know, the, I don't know, the, the flags the, to the orange the, sticks, the orange sticks yeah. to tell the plane where to go. Yeah. Um, it's not to say, you know, it's always human error and it's one person's fault, which is often the kinds of solutions that people want to have. They say, you know, we as an organization have to accept what's happened. We have to take on this failure and we have to think of, okay, what about the ways in which we've put people into a situation that allowed for this engine failure to occur, right? It's not one person's problem. Mm -hmm. It's all our problem. Mm -hmm. And that kind of cultural shift has led to at least um, better ways of managing these events when they occur. Yeah, and learning from them. And learning yeah. from them, right? That's a big deal. And so... Many industries, I think, would benefit from looking at that as an example and being able to internalize that. But it's 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 uh, just culture is, you know, from a safety perspective, is really crazy to some you know industries. Yeah. yeah, it's it's very difficult to to justify economically. It's very difficult to you know convince your sea level people or the people within your organizations to you know not want to blame someone for a problem that occurred. Yeah, so that's one thing that I think we can push towards. Great. Well, Dan, thanks a lot for, for chatting with us today. Um, if people are interested in learning more about you or your work, is there where can they find you? Uh, I'm part of a couple of, I guess, online organizations. One is Urban Resilience Research uh, Network. That's urbanresilienceresearch.net. And the other one is resilient in, sorry, resilienceengineeringinstitute.org. Um, and then also you can check out my Google Scholar page, Daniel A. Eisenberg or anything like that. Check out some of my research and, you know, contact me, find me. Um, I'll send you anything you like. Yeah, lots of good stuff. <laughs> lots of good work. <laughs> All right, Dan Eisenberg, thanks a lot. Yeah. The Future Cities podcast is an outreach effort brought to you by the Urban Resilience to Extremes Sustainability Research Network, or UREX as we usually refer to it. To learn more about UREX, visit www.sustainability.asu.edu forward slash urban resilience. If you have questions, feedback, or suggestions for future episodes, you can email us at futurecitiespodcast at gmail.com or find us on Twitter at futurecitiespod. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time.